this probably six years back was the new kid on the block and you know, people started adopting, adopting it, etc. But again, going back to the business challenges, right? We said, well, we had microservices and we had everything. Our problem was really, how do I take my those hundreds of microservices, which could you know, mean many, many, probably a few more hundreds of you know, pods in Kubernetes terminology and how do I go about deploying them? And if things go wrong, how do I go about rolling it back? I mean, that was our one of the challenge, right? So how is that overcome? Uh, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So basically like think the most important part is uh, how one talks with uh, Kubernetes to carry out a particular task. So if, if I go back to definition again, what really a Kubernetes is, it is going to do the workload management or allocation of work across different uh, nodes without mm -hmm. my DevOps engineer, uh, you know, aware that uh, where exactly uh, my really apps are, uh, apps are going to run. So basically what it really does is it is currently running at a particular state. My application is running fine. And now my DevOps engineer wants to deploy some new state. So maybe uh, engineer is interested in upgrading a certain service or maybe launching a totally new service uh, totally. Or maybe they have realized like fine that I need to allocate some additional uh, space uh, to a certain application. So what really a DevOps engineer they, they really do is they create uh, a description file. Or remember I had mentioned something called as Helm charts. So using those uh, those Helm charts, they, they will simply uh, put the, all those instructions in a declarative fashion and then submit to Kubernetes to take to the whatever the desired uh, state. And then once no that script, is submitted- No scripts to be written. That's absolutely, what absolutely. You so you batch, just have a- script and, uh, Yes, yes. Right. You just have a declarative thing, give it to Kubernetes and Kubernetes will uh, will take care of actually implementing your, uh, your instruction. I think that's the- really big power of uh, Kubernetes. Just simply accept whatever declarative it has been given. And then it, it looks at its own configuration, what kind of nodes are there and what needs to be upgraded and simply it will carry out its uh, own task. So that is that is really you know, a magic, <laughs> I, must, I must say. And then uh, the another th uh, key thing here is that, uh, see many times what happens is whenever you are going to install a new version, at least it used to happen in a monolithic uh, kind of architecture. Like one has to bring down the whole application. But in case of microservices, your individual microservices can have their own life cycle as far as uh, upgradation is uh, really concerned. So what really here we are talking about is within, within really uh, here in Kubernetes, we are simply going to have the deployment of our application such that individual services may follow their own path. So some services may get upgraded, some services may not get uh, upgraded. On. And here the key challenge is that maybe your service may be running across uh, multiple nodes. So how really uh, to ensure that your service gets installed or your service gets uh, upgraded in a seamless uh, kind of a manner. And then that's where uh, an interesting strategy is adopted by Kubernetes, which is called as a rolling update uh, kind of a strategy. So what it really does is just to take an example, suppose if my service A needs to be upgraded and maybe service A is running across, uh, let's say three nodes. So initially Kubernetes may only try to upgrade only a certain, maybe a one node and then ensure that that node is successfully upgraded. It is up and running, it is available. It has started accepting requests and then it will go about upgrading the remaining nodes. So it is like a rolling update uh, kind of a strategy. So that's a very powerful uh, deployment strategy. And that's very powerful because that whole concept of a downtime goes away, right? It's absolutely, like a zero downtime. Absolutely. Zero downtime yeah. and then I can update anytime. Like maybe if I'm, uh, uh, I'm a part of some microservices team and then I just want to make a small change, I can make a change, then deploy it. And then uh, further, depending upon where my service is running, only that thing will get upgraded without bringing anything down. So that whole thing is managed by uh, Kubernetes. So that's really a powerful thing. And another- I think another, few years back in the, in the monolithic world, probably we used to do, do that or I used to do that, like, you know, but we had to write a lot of scripts, right? Because you can do, you know, get version 1.2 up, 1.1 1, 1 is also up, but you have to go and modify the load balancer so that it now routes to both, both of them. Absolutely, when, absolutely. Then you monitor for some time manually or whatever through scripts and you know all that, and then you shut down the original one, right? One point. Absolutely. What you're saying Absolutely. is now it does it uh, automatically, right? Declaratively. Absolutely. I don't Please, have to write a script. For you as a development engineer, you don't have to keep a track of the registry, like what kind yeah. of servers are running where, which version is running where, 
and you mm. and then uh, otherwise you have to keep track of all that and then ensure that if x gets upgraded if it gets upgraded okay then go to y if y then go to z so all those scripting uh, one has to write as a deployment engineer in case of kubernetes yeah. you don't have to worry about that just do it in a declarative fashion this is what i want and just delegate the responsibility to kubernetes to take care of the deployment and then it will do its magic i think that's the power yeah, of my, my... Yeah, I think in the microservices world, DevOps engineer can go mad if he has to do it for hundred microservices and keep track of all this himself. Absolutely, right? absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. So this is where and it then comes. Another to, biggest yeah. challenge is that this is fine. Like even if they may have, they may even Im- install, but what if if suddenly uh, they realize, oh my, certain uh, upgrade uh, is uh, there is some there is some bug and I need to roll it back. And now imagine uh, if one has to roll back. those uh, updates which are gone i think that's a big big uh, challenge but in case of uh, kubernetes we can also bring back to a previous state even that is also possible because what it really does is it just take from one state to another state so that's that's the power of uh, kubernetes not only it will have a rolling update but also will help to roll it uh, roll back also okay fantastic i think this is really powerful absolutely yeah, powerful yeah. and this probably addresses one of the bigger challenges that you mentioned absolutely, earlier absolutely absolutely but i think and then it increases mind, the speed huh. of uh, delivery massively uh, speed of massively, deployment exactly. massively right yeah exactly right otherwise because you can't deliver faster you know i mean you can't deploy faster you will not develop faster right i mean or your faster development has no meaning if you can't deploy faster yeah, right? yeah absolutely absolutely absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. absolutely. and then they are independent no? you can so you, i may have yeah. multiple now with microservices world like you may have multiple independent teams and they may have their own uh, schedules and then right. so i don't have to wait uh, until the whole uh, other services are ready to be deployed see that's that's a power of it in fact there is an right. interesting thing uh, i think uh, it was uh, probably i think airbnb airbnb adopted uh, uh, kubernetes Exactly. and then uh, one of the services like they then i think they they migrated really hundreds of uh, services and the services Absolutely. were fairly uh, it could be very easy to understand like for example in a search bar uh, show me uh, properties maybe in mahabaleshwar or maybe in london whatever so depending right. upon the query it has to go back and then uh, depending upon my choice and maybe my past history you have to suggest properties depending upon my date range and etc Now imagine this particular service is, I think, one of the most important service, and it will keep on changing very fast. Now, if I have to bring back the whole application just because there is an additional innovation has come, that is definitely not uh, acceptable. So these kind of innovations really started uh, happening much faster because of Kubernetes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, interesting. So, so that address addresses that one important challenge. But in my mind. uh let's say i have these hundreds of microservices and kubernetes manages to deploy them across the nodes mm-hmm. but how do you really ensure because i don't have a large uh, you know estate of hardware right i have few bare metal you know machines or maybe vmware machines a few ec2 boxes is what i have booked right but i have hundreds uh, hundreds to thousands of nodes right so how is this all managed because i mean if you can't really if it just deploys and uh, one pod starts killing other pod or whatever right i think there will be havoc right so how do, is there a way to you know control all this like uh, absolutely absolutely so mm-hmm. that's where there is an interesting concept what they call it as automatic bean packing so what it really means is uh, it's it's very fairly simple uh, thing so what it does is you have set of pods and those pods are going to run on on the nodes but one thing which we have to keep in mind is node has at the end of the day no ha- node has a certain uh, limitation like it, it may have a certain set of cores it may have a certain uh, memory and then beyond that you can't really increase because the node memory is full or node core computing power is uh, full so what you do is you have additional uh, as a startup yeah. i have only limited budget that's another absolutely, thing that's absolutely, my budget is absolutely. limited so yeah so what yeah. kubernetes has really done is rather than managing at the node level node always has that mm-hmm. particular fixed memory so they manage at the pod level at the pod level then i can specify fine like i will like minimum of, of for my pod uh, like minimum minimum memory or minimum computing is let's say x and then max it can go up to a y kind of a level so that kind of definition uh, i can give and then what kubernetes really does is whenever a new pod is to be deployed then it actually goes and searches uh, on on my different nodes is where i can run this pod in a most uh, effective manner and then there it ensures then there are different kind of an algorithms like for example uh, if if i may have uh, more than one uh, kind of a node 
then it may decide which node is most suitable for this current uh, pod to be deployed. And then uh, let's say if I if I'm a little bit uh, restricted on budget, then I may not uh, I may keep on uh, I may instruct that fine like don't uh, pack uh, the node as much as uh, possible. But if I'm okay with the budget, then I may have an additional node and keep maybe 25 30 percent capacity free on individual nodes. So all those things are managed by uh, Kubernetes, and then it does that does that very intelligently. So me as a deployment engineer doesn't have to worry about that. I will simply give to Kubernetes like this is what I want, and you find out from a node which is the right node for this particular pod to run. So that's really a, a big, uh, powerful uh, feature. And so, so I can optimize fashion making the you know doing the matchmaking right. Absolutely, and that, is, that is that is absolutely uh, that is a real so like workflow a, man management. Or, uh, absolutely. So there is a very powerful node selection uh, algorithm. So it selects based on some uh, scoring strategy, and then uh, it right. will deploy that pod onto that. So that's really a powerful thing, and it's automatic. So that's that's the best right. part of it. Right. Like you rightly said, so declarative and automatic. But, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And then that's so that, about the pod. That takes yeah. care of. Yeah. Huh, that takes care of pod, but I think my application, or Microsoft application, would need some kind of a file storage in some fashion and all that, right? We are so much used to it. Absolutely, how, absolutely. Because yeah. in this complex environment now, how do you handle the storage then? Absolutely. See, uh, hmm. similar to this uh, bin packing and all that, there is another thing uh, like managing the storage, or maybe hmm. like, uh, we can say it's a storage orchestration. So your storage could be, uh, you can mount a storage system of uh, your choice. And then what Kubernetes does is automatically it will mount that uh, whatever the storage which is, uh, which is required. It could be a local storage, or maybe it could be a storage from a public cloud provider like AWS, uh, et cetera. And then uh, it, it may have some kind of a declaration fine, like I may like to have 20 GB kind of a storage allocated. And then if, if that storage uh, uh, starts uh, getting filled and if it reaches to a certain capacity, then there will be a rule or a configuration within Kubernetes to allocate additional uh, thing. So again, uh, to manage storage in a very optimal manner that can be configured in Kubernetes. In fact, Kubernetes does it in an automatic manner. So that's a further uh, interesting part of it. So it not only manages the beam part, that's the actual code which is going to run, but also the storage uh, aspect of it. Okay. Yeah, interesting. I'm sorry, that is interesting because I think I'm optimizing my uh, IT assets. This is one of the most important thing, right? Uh, for all this. So Absolutely. Exactly. This is fantastic. And then, yeah. and then one has to really worry about because the moment you are going to allocate storage, then you are going to pay for that actually, whether it's an AWS or whatever. And then uh, your credit card will keep on getting charged. <laughs> so that's why one exactly. has to be really, really careful about uh, that. So one right. has to do it in an optimal manner. So that's where it helps yeah. uh, a lot. Correct, correct. So this is all good and no, where my credit card will now next get charged is when actually I have the end user, which is a good thing and my end users are increasing, which is also a good thing. But now I have this optimized storage, uh, I know, optimized deployment and uh, then suddenly I have these, uh, you know, a lot of more load coming in, right? So in that case, I need to scale, right, essentially. And hmm. scale, like you were saying, there might be a spike, so I need to scale temporarily. Uh, and then later on, you know, basically, if I'm on AWS, I have to manage my cost also, right? Uh, I can't just Absolutely. book hundreds yeah, of yeah. EC2 instances. So, in this scenario, how does Kubernetes help? Basically? Yeah. See, basically, what it uh, what it really does is uh, basically what what is called as horizontal uh, auto scaling. So, uh, depending upon the need, like for example, let's say if Kubernetes realizes that you have you are reaching to a certain limit, and then the uh, the load on the system is increasing. So at that time, then it will simply add a new node and then start getting, uh, start deploying pods onto that particular uh, node. So that way you can keep on increasing uh, your your infrastructure uh, in a horizontal kind of a manner. So rather than increasing the power of a single machine, so you keep on increasing uh, auto scaling in a horizontal way. But it's not just horizontal auto scaling. Let's say when your uh, load is going to come down. So at that time, what Kubernetes does is it it checks fine like. Currently, my uh, pods are under uh, underutilized. So what it may do is it may even remove a node from uh, from my cluster, and then take uh, all that load to other uh, nodes which are uh, which are really contributing or managing the workload. So uh, it will not only scale uh, scale up, 
but also it will scale scale down so that is something which is done in a very intelligent uh, manner so even if uh, my load increases so my infrastructure will take care of that but then uh, if it comes down then automatically it will scale down also and that uh, me, uh, me as a devops engineer doesn't have to worry about it it will uh, do it in an automatic uh, manner and devops management also will be happy because they they monitor the budget right so they'll be very very happy absolutely. that Absolutely. Uh, you, if you have EC2 instance just running like that, you know, it's like going to increase their heart rate and you know, heartbeat rate. So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, so this is good. But now that has scaled, right? So for one service, we are talking about the source service uh, you know, in Airbnb and all that, right? Now let's say I have 10, 20 pods running, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how, but then how does that whole discovery happen, right? Because now that new pods have to be discovered or whatever, right? the whole service has to be discovered or one service has to talk to the other service. How does, how is that managed by Kubernetes? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. See, actually that's where this control plane uh, comes into, into picture. So mm -hmm. whenever you deploy, uh, uh, deploy a particular service or an uh, application, so there is a concept called as Kubernetes uh, service. And that Kubernetes service uh, is uh, identified maybe by a DNS name or may, it may have its own IP address. But that is something by which that service is uh, identified. But inside that service may be deployed on multiple, uh, really uh, multiple pods. So what Kubernetes, uh, this control plane does is it helps not only to discover that particular service, but also does the load balancing. So as far as uh, the service consumers, they just talk to that particular service, but inside it may go to uh, uh, go to a different uh, really uh, really nodes depending upon the load balancing or whatever the configuration which is done. So that whole thing is sort of abstracted. So the discovery of service which is uh, provided by uh, Kubernetes and also the uh, the load balancing part of that, so that it ensures that you are only one uh, pod is not under pressure. If the number of uh, request increases, then it will distribute uh, horizontally across uh, multiple pods. And then again, the whole thing like service uh, registry, service discovery and load balancing that is also taken care by Kubernetes. So that's a very, very powerful uh, feature. So you can distribute uh, your network traffic in your entire uh, uh, cluster deployment. So this is fascinating. And in this auto scaling, as well as you know, in uh, you know managing the service to service communication, you are saying I I don't have to write a piece of code or you know I don't have to write a bunch of scripts or something like that, right? This is all declarative, is what you are saying. Absolutely, right? absolutely. Yeah. That's amazing, exactly right. Okay, so that's uh, fantastic. But I'm sure this is all good, and you no know, happy day scenarios are there, but there are rainy day scenarios, right? And in production, in every production, things will fail. So in yeah, this case, absolutely. in this world. <laughs> Pods also will fail, right? Uh, so what happens when pods absolutely, fail? Basically? Absolutely. Yeah. See, again, our brain or heart, uh, this control plane is monitoring everything. And then mm. uh, what it really does is it, it does the health check of uh, each and every pod which is, which is running. And then uh, suppose if a particular pod is uh, not responding or if there is some problem with that particular pod, then it uh, stops sending any requests to that particular pod. And then uh, the whole traffic which is there or maybe a set of tasks which are getting executed, where which are supposed to be executed on that particular pod are diverted to some other uh, healthy pod. And then it tries to heal that particular pod, pod and tries to bring it up uh, again. And if it is ready to accept request, then only it is made available uh, for processing the task. But if it realize that uh, it is not able to uh, heal that pod, then it may simply kill that and create uh, create a new one. So, so it's it's like a self healing uh, kind of a process. So that's where this brain part of uh, control plane will come into picture. So it will continuously monitor the, what is the health of its pods, and if something uh, something has happened, then it may simply uh, drop it and create new. And that may even happen at the level of a node. And then all that uh, pods which are there on that particular node, then they may get uh, recreated again. Okay. Oh. So that's that's a really a powerful uh, part. And this is like a self healing. So the system will heal itself. Your engineer may may have to just monitor if it is healing on its own. That's that's the only thing which they have to monitor. They don't have to intervene into that. That's the power of it. Because definitely hardware is going to fail, and then there are going to be challenges. Maybe a certain program may create a problem. So at that time, the whole system should not come down. So that's where Kubernetes will take uh, care of that. 
it's a lot to digest from kubernetes perspective absolutely is there anything more that kubernetes does <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, i think it's it's there are tons of things but uh, yeah. i think what we are we are really covering today is only the high level and most important part high of level. it but apart right. from that there are a few things which i would like to mention is uh, the most important thing is uh, the secret and configuration management see one thing what we have realized here is Uh, basically the deployment the actual deployment is not in our hands so kubernetes takes the definition points out what is best for it and then it deploys so naturally anything uh, which is uh, configuration level maybe it could be as simple as your api keys or maybe your database secrets or maybe your uh, certificates so all those things you have to ensure that they are not part of your uh, main particular stack so what really kubernetes yeah, yeah. does it takes that out and manage it manage it uh, for you so your core application doesn't have any of them it kubernetes supplies uh, all the secrets and configuration to it so that they can come up uh, very fast and then that also makes the application overall application much more secure so secret right. and configuration management is another very powerful feature of uh, yeah. kubernetes absolutely yeah. and then the key thing is that you don't have to hard code that inside your deployment so you can change the configuration in fact one of the i think uh, i think it was booking.com probably see their main challenge was that they had a different set of environments so one was a dev environment then they used to have an environment for the actual load testing the other environment was uh, pre production maybe a production so on so forth so now imagine every time if i have to keep on changing that and then deploy the whole thing then the whole thing will become very complex so instead of that my core deployment is same then i have to simply change my secrets and configurations and then the rest will be taken care of that so that's a very very powerful uh, feature and then uh, like absolutely and, perspective yeah yeah security perspective and then also by uh, by mistake then developers will not be really checking in the api keys or uh, database passwords uh, etc so in fact i'm sure the, the version control management uh, software will take care of that but still i think uh, this kind of practice is really very highly uh, recommended the next uh, another important thing is uh, batch execution like what we has uh, what we have seen up till now is you have multiple instances and they are they are more like uh, maybe uh, uh, as i had mentioned like search service so there is a request which is going to come then i may search do some search maybe fire some queries and give a return back or maybe i may get an uh, create order api call i will create an order and return the response back but then there are certain other uh types of uh, jobs as well like for example let's say i may have a very complex or a time consuming job which is like a machine learning kind of job so it's going to take good amount of time and then there may be a batch execution involved into that so kubernetes also uh, has a feature for executing the task in a batch uh, kind of a mode so maybe it's like a your ml engine so which is if you have to train your uh, machine ml engine then for those those training or uh, algorithms are going to take good amount of time so kubernetes also has that uh, kind of feature and then many many uh, really more but i think what we cover are the most important and the most famous features which are addressing yeah. the business challenges uh, which we saw yeah, okay. so this is impressive so let me see if i can kind of quickly summarize what i understood right uh, you know the value of kubernetes if you want to say it that way right from business perspective right uh, for the no the, biz, uh, the startup entrepreneurs and you know business decision makers you know why they should look at kubernetes is it definitely allows me you know uh, as a you know so entrepreneur to you know take my products or my, my services much faster to the market because i can actually you know automate this rollout not just so you know once a month or whatever i can do all this all along you know many times a day etc and things go wrong i can roll them back that's yeah, yeah, one absolutely. very great value added addition Because I have adapted this new technology stack and microservices and what not, right? So I need this, but at the same time, I don't have a lot of money. You know, I have a little hardware, and maybe my my assets are spread over the globe, right? And mm -hmm. I can still optimize. And I'm assuming I can form form a Kubernetes cluster using few sort of few bare metal servers here in in Pune and few bare metal servers somewhere in London and what not, right? And I can do that, and Absolutely. also chip in chip in EC2 instances whenever needed. So uh no all properly uh they can become nodes wherever i want in my cluster and you know uh, use them in optimized fashion i think if uh, i get it right uh, and not just the hardware the storage also essentially and then of course uh, scalability right scalability 
availability because you mentioned how you know you can you know not just scale and get the pods up and running but also do the appropriate load balancing across them and if things go wrong then there is a self healing built in right uh, so all the time my customer is not impacted that is the most important thing right uh, customer is and that is taken care of yeah, yeah yeah so even if the hot deployment and all those things are happening or my uh, infrastructure is scaling horizontally or auto scaling up or scaling down the end, end customer is absolutely not at all concerned about that as long as my site is responding or app is responding in a optimal that manner is, that's, that's it really. yeah. that's that's the power yeah. of it yeah that's the power and then finally what i see is because now i'm using containerization anyways containerization gives me benefit of moving cross right i could be on 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 prem or i can if i'm building a product i can use the same one put it on azure or aws and all that the problem was how do i deploy how do i manage all these failovers and you no know, scalability and all that and that is where kubernetes is adding tremendous value you know, Absolutely. for me Absolutely. as a product or a service uh, you know owner yeah okay so and that talk. also in a standardized think, manner yeah. i think that is another uh, exactly. important part it's not like a proprietary correct. solution developed by individual organization for their their apps hmm. yeah correct so that's the power of it so that and then it's yeah. more like a predictable uh, kind of so maybe you have a set of kubernetes engineers then they know what to do really that is something right. which is very very important yeah. true true i think in this i think you mentioned a couple of examples airbnb and i think you said booking.com and yeah, i remember yeah. even shopify which is the most popular whatever you want to call it a storefront platform whatever right uh, yeah, e-commerce yeah. platform even that uses uh, kubernetes right? absolutely uh, absolutely shopify also read that study somewhere yeah. yes 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 it is there on kubernetes uh, website as well so shopify mm, also sorry. like uh, it grew really fast uh, fast and then uh, like typically if you have seen uh, some in e-commerce like there are a lot of innovations have happened so it's now uh, nowhere it is uh, you know a simple uh, uh, you just buy, select the product and buy so there are auto suggestions and then uh, based on your history it will keep on suggesting new things to you then discounts and so n number of things which keeps on happening and all those services if you have to roll it in a faster manner then you have to have something like uh, kubernetes in place I, mean, I had read they had even few years back they had like 500 plus services right uh, which means multiply that by 3 6 whatever those are the pods thousands right and still they were deploying maybe 50 or 100 times a day or something like that so absolutely, that is absolutely. phenomenal yeah. phenomenal <laughs> absolutely so like yeah. any point of that continuously kubernetes is doing deployment in that case correct correct exactly yeah, yeah. and they are regional which means they have you know clouds all across the globe right and they have to do the same deployment yes, everywhere yes, right yes. So, absolutely absolutely <laughs> okay fantastic so so that really brings out the value you know business value and you know how do you tackle the business challenges uh, you know by using the technologies and technology that you knew of but how to, not to orchestrate them and manage them in a mm. much better better fashion right yeah, yeah. okay fantastic yeah. this all sounds like amazing but again i'm assuming kubernetes is not the silver bullet for everything right so <laughs> it must must be having its own gocha or it must be bringing its own cost of ownership so what guidance would you like to give you know, yeah, somebody yeah, wants to look at kubernetes yeah. so i think the more one thing which uh, like uh, where one one misconception uh, which i have seen is sometimes people assume that kubernetes is like platform as a service so it 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 will take care of uh, you know everything including hardware and everything it is there inside that so it's it's not like pl- platform as a service it is something which is going to sit on the top of uh, the hardware which is already been provisioned whether it is whether it's a bare metal servers or it could be uh, at the uh, some somebody like aws or azure who is going to provide that particular platform so kubernetes works only at the container level it doesn't uh, work below below that so below that you have to have uh your own uh, platform your own in the sense you have to have use azure or aws or maybe your own uh, servers so i think this is one thing which one has to keep in mind so you have to have your servers or uh, host it on aws or azure and so on and so forth so that's i think uh, most important thing which we have to keep in mind and then uh, uh rather than having our own kubernetes uh, and then have a uh, maybe a virtual or maybe an ec2 machines on aws one can also use uh, Uh, the standard public cloud providers which are providing managed kubernetes services so you don't have to have your own kubernetes you can use their managed solution and then which definitely reduces the overall cost of uh, managing uh, kubernetes but then again one has to keep in mind if you use that then you may get locked into a certain vendor so maybe if you use 
manage kubernetes service from maybe aws or azure you may get locked to that so that's one another thing which you have to keep in mind third thing is uh, as uh, uh, you must have guessed is it's not simple even if it addresses uh, and gives us a lot of interesting solution it still needs a lot of expertise so it needs investment in training and skill development of uh, engineers so there is a significant amount of investment is required in developing your uh, deployment engineers and also investment in terms of hardware so maybe there may not be any investment in terms of kubernetes as a software but overall you need investment in uh, hardware to use it in an effective manner so i think this is one thing which we have to keep in mind and lastly i think i would like to add is fine it's it's great but that's not the only solution there are alternatives so you can also evaluate those alternatives like for example aws has something called as aws fargate or azure as azure container services google has google cloud run but then again uh, it goes back to our original thing of ecs you may get locked in to that but uh, one can always evaluate and see what is best suited uh, for your application fantastic i think this is great prasad so i think this was i'm assuming a very enlightening session for for the many uh, who yeah. haven't you know, totally used or in enlightening and long session i think it's a fairly complex it's a long session trying to yeah. trying to zip or uh, <laughs> into a smaller yeah. thing but i think it's a very correct, correct. very interesting exactly. but a complex session yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, i hope it motivates a lot of you friends uh, you know, who are who are watching this you know to you know understand you know where and where not to use kubernetes etc and uh, and if you have liked it then do like this video and definitely there is a subscribe button on this chai coffee channel uh, do subscribe to it uh, and then as time progresses you will get to hear a lot more interesting stories right so you will get to hear about the technologies and innovations in technology not just that but you will also get to meet up a lot of startup uh, you know owners and you know some founders and how they leverage different technologies to address or you know bring in innovations you know into their solutions you will also get to see some vcs and investors and other gurus in the industry talk about how they take decisions in terms of you know investing and mentoring startups and things like that so do do stay tuned and thanks on our behalf thank you thank you thank you very much please feel free to send your suggestions comments and please subscribe Definitely. our channel thank you okay bye bye